Hi, this is Dr. Nick from the ECG Academy with Chalk Talk number nine. Chalk Talk's assume you know the basics, so what I'm trying to do is get you used to reading more complicated tracings. And this time I'm going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to talk clinically, okay, because a lot of you will have to take uh, board questions and uh, I want you to get thinking along those lines. So let's imagine a case, okay? And this is a 59-year-old woman who has a history of depression and she's on Effexor and she gets a urinary tract infection with fever and chills and so forth and gets admitted to the hospital and her doctor puts her on an antibiotic commonly used, uh, well, let's say Levaquin. And then in the middle of the night, the nurse calls you up and says, you know, something funny happened on the monitor. I wonder if you can take a look at it. And here's the rhythm strip they give you. And uh, here's the question. What do you do? Okay, do you A, go back to sleep, it's only artifact? Do you B, give IV cartizem? Would you C, give IV amiodarone? Or D, none of the above? Um, uh, so let's get to it. Let's get rid of these and let's start looking at this tracing because it is pretty bizarre. And that's why I didn't make it basic. It's kind of an intermediate tracing. Um, when you first look at that, look at it, you ha kind of have to look at the forest um, because there's almost no no pattern to this, and uh, um, you see all these really weird looking beats over here, and it, it kind of does kind of give a sense of artifact. And um, imagine if this is a very itchy patient; she's probably scratching herself all over the place and giving you all these numbers, but all these beats. But let's look uh, more carefully, okay? Shall we look at the trees? So these first couple of beats, they really do look wide and bizarre. And I mean, they certainly could be ventricular beats because of that. But lo and behold, oh my goodness, uh, thank goodness we actually found a normal looking beat. Um, so we have some somewhere to start. You have a, a nice looking P wave. We have a PR interval that's fairly normal. It's almost 0.2, I'd say, and a QRS that's narrow. And so great. So now we have, after a short pause, of maybe 600 milliseconds or so, we have this, the beginning of this run, this run of something. And the first beat almost kind of looks like the normal beat, except the R wave's a little bit taller and it looks a little wider, and I'm not really sure about that. But then you've got these wide complex beats starting at a rate of about maybe 160 beats per minute, and then it speeds up somewhat. It gets to be um gee almost um 180 close to 200 beats a minute at the end and then it it, it and then it seems to change doesn't it it it, it the, you have these wide beats and then it kind of changes its appearance and now you've got these funny crazy looking beats and then it finally stops and you get ah another another normal beat and then the pr is a little bit long here but i'm not going to make too much of that because all of a sudden you've got a couple of of wide beats again and then a normal beat once again, and then a, a run of, of a wide complex tachycardia, if that's what it is, if, if you're convinced it's not an artifact. I mean, when you scan around, you don't see anything that looks like a normal QRS peeking out from any of these beats. So we, let's assume it's not artifact for the time being. Here's another QRS. This time the PR is a little bit shorter. And then there's, you know, four beats of this wide something or other, and, and then another normal beat and probably a P wave here. That's another normal beat. So, oh my goodness, two normal beats in a row. I guess we can figure out what the sinus node is doing. Okay, so if we measure out the rate, we get 300, 150, 175. It's between 60 and 75, close to 75. So maybe 68 or 70 beats per minute, um, assuming this conducts. Okay, here, I'll make you feel better. Okay, is that better? <laughs> All right, anyway, all right, so we've got a sinus bradycardia or, you know, barely a sinus rhythm. Um, and But then we have these wide complex tachycardias. All right, so when we're figuring out where a wide complex tachycardia comes from, what should we be looking for? Well, how does it start? Is there a P wave in front of the first beat? Because that's a really important clue. If you see a P wave with a normal or a slightly prolonged PR interval, and it's most likely atrial, and you start to think about cardism for some kind of atrial arrhythmia with aberrant conduction. So if we kind of look at the T wave of this beat that precedes the tachycardia, 
Mm, I don't know about that. I don't I don't see I don't see any bumps or bites or anything high frequency that I would that I would uh, call a P wave. Remember atrial activity on top of a T wave is usually easy to see, but I I just don't see it here. So if there's no P wave in front of this bead, then the, the presumption is that it's ventricular. But if it's it's ventricular and you have rates in the 150 to 200 range, we're talking about ventricular tachycardia. Well, let's think about VTAC for a little while and, and kind of remember the classification of VTAC when you're trying to make an electrocardiographic diagnosis. You have several different varieties. So you have monomorphic ventricular tachycardia, and that, of course, is where all the beats look the same, at least in the same lead, right? If you look at a different lead, it's going to look differently, of course, but monomorphic means all the beats look alike in, in one lead, so it's the same morphology. Um, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia uh, is this ventricular tachycardia where the beats seem to change over time, and you may have at least uh, two different morphologies during this run of ventricular tachycardia. So that's called polymorphic VT. Now, these are generally at rates uh, below 300 beats per minute. When you get to rates above 300 beats per minute, then the, the names change a little bit. A monomorphic ventricular tachycardia at above 300 beats per minute is often referred to as ventricular flutter. Think of atrial flutter as being an atrial rate of around 300. So monomorphic VT at 300 beats per minute or above, ventricular flutter. Um, and then if you have a polymorphic ventricular arrhythmia greater than 300 beats per minute, what do we call it? And that's ventricular fibrillation. Okay, so that's pretty simple. You know that. So as far as classification is concerned, you look at this run and you say, that looks monomorphic kind of sort of here. It does change a little from one beat to the next, but then clearly it changes in a big way. The beats become much smaller. I don't know what's going on. Help me out, Dr. Nick. Well, okay, there's one thing that I left out very conveniently because you guys were supposed to do it. Oh, dear. Now, we, you guys were supposed to make all the measurements, and and maybe you did, maybe you didn't. You, you guys who know how to read ECGs should have pulled out your calipers. Let me pull out my trusty calipers and notice that the QT interval of this sinus bead over here in the beginning um, measures out to be a whopping 700 milliseconds. Oh, my goodness. 700 millisecond QT interval you better not go back to sleep. Let me tell you, something bad's happening here. So with 700 milliseconds, and then the, this this tachycardia starts up, what's the first thing you really need to think about? Look, you got a long QT interval. You have a polymorphic VTAC. Almost certainly what this is, is you guys know, right? Torsade de pointe. Okay, what is torsade de pointe? It's actually a French word, and it means revolving around a point. It's a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia that was named because the complexes seem to get bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller, and the idea is that the axis of the tachycardia seem to be kind of spinning around in space, and that's why they named it this way, torsade de pointe. It's kind of a cool name. But when you look in the textbooks, you'll usually see... A polymorphic VTAC that gets smaller, and then it gets bigger, and then it gets smaller, and it looks very classic. In all the books, it looks the same, and that's kind of not what this looks like. But it is. It's torsade, trust me. Even though it looks sort of fairly monomorphic in the beginning, clearly the morphology changes, and what's happening is the axis changes and that makes the, the QRS much larger initially in this in this ECG lead, but then when the axis shifts suddenly, the QRS gets much smaller because it's going to be bigger in a different lead, right? So you get this polymorphic non-sustained VT. It can become sustained, and it can sometimes degenerate into ventricular fibrillation. Torsade can. But what's causing it all? Well, this really really long QT interval. I think I think in this particular patient. Um, the cause is the drugs. So what you're dealing with here is something called the drug-induced long QT syndrome, Dilquits, right? Drug-induced long QT syndrome because Effexor is known to increase QT interval in some patients, and certainly Levaquin has been reported to increase QT interval. So you got the combination of two agents, 
And most of these patients actually have the genetic predisposition to reacting badly to these drugs, and that's what causes the QT to get longer. All right, but let's kind of talk about Torsad for a couple of minutes. I, I just want to get you guys thinking, oh, 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 how, to, how do you recognize it? Well, we'll get rid of the tracing and we'll get rid of some of this stuff. And uh, I want to sort of draw a little Torsad on the paper here. Because Torsad has a very characteristic appearance. First of all, when you look at the QRS complex, it's usually narrow, but the QT interval is very long. And uh, that's that's usually a precursor of Torsad. You really have to see a long QT. Sometimes you'll see big U waves, especially. Now, the other thing that's characteristic of Torsad is that it's pause dependent. What do I mean by that? Well, what what happens to the normal QT interval when rates get faster? Okay, let's think about this. When the, when you have a slow rate, the QT is generally longer. And when you have a faster rate, the QT generally shortens. That's why we correct the QT interval um, by using this uh, QTC or corrected QT interval. So, so generally after a long pause, the QT will usually get longer. But in Torsad, you'll see that the, the T wave becomes really bizarre after a pause. So let's say you have a PVC here, and then you have a compensatory pause. After that pause, the normal beat comes in, but if you look at that T wave, it's really big and long and with crazy um, U waves and so forth. And then what you usually see is the first beat of the tachycardia arrives from the, the T wave or from the TU complex. And the first, so the first beat of the tachycardia arises from the T. So because the QT is long, what that tells you is the first beat of the tachycardia has is widely coupled, sometimes 600 milliseconds, which is equal to 100 beats per minute. That's um, uh, common. So you see this widely coupled beat. That's the first beat of the tachycardia because it's arising from this QT complex, which is very long because it's following this pause. So you've got the long QT. You've got the pause dependence. You've got the bizarre T wave after a pause, and the first beat attack of cardia is widely coupled um, and, uh, and arises from the TU complex. And of course, it's polymorphic at rates usually in the range of 150 to 200, sometimes 220 beats per minute. So this is classically what Torsad uh, comes from. And if you guys want to do some more research into early after depolarizations, if you do a cell membrane, transmembrane potential, it's these af early after depolarizations that cause the beats in torsad. Um, but if you go on my website, I'll be talking about mechanisms of arrhythmias and triggered activity or early after depolarization is going to be part of that discussion. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, if we get rid of this and bring our tracing back, you'll see that... Um, you'll see that indeed following this pause, you have a very long bizarre T wave with a QT interval of 700 milliseconds. The first beat of the tachycardia arises a very long coupling interval, and you've got this um, periods of monomorphic looking, but it really is polymorphic because these beats are much bigger, then it gets smaller, then it gets much smaller, and then of course it gets bigger again. So you've got this polymorphic VTAC. This is classic torsan, but it doesn't look like the textbook. That's what I'm trying to do is get you guys to understand that not every ECG looks the same. They don't all look, look like the textbooks, and that's why uh, you need to watch these chalk talks and go on to ECG Academy. So let's figure out what the answer to the question is. Uh, it's not A, because we've already figured out it's not artifact. You wouldn't give IV cardizem because it's, it's not a natural arrhythmia and you're not trying to block the AV node. You certainly would not give amiodarone because what does amiodarone do? It increases the QT interval, and that would just make things worse. The answer is none of the above. What you would give for torsat is magnesium. That's right, a couple of grams of magnesium will help to settle this down. Of course, you remove the offending agent, and you get the patient stabilized in intensive care. It's a serious problem, but it is reversible. Um, so that's uh, chalk talk number nine, remember? Go to ecgacademy.com to learn everything from basic to advanced to read ECGs. I do want to make you become an ECG expert, but also subscribe to my YouTube um, ECG doc channel so you'll 
be informed as soon as I do my next Chalk Talk. Meanwhile, thanks for listening. See you soon.